Thank you, artists. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for having me here today. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Charm. I was here last September, and it's wonderful to be back in this church again. I, I honor you and all of you here for the many ways that you connect with the divine through music, through poetry. There are many ways for us to, to see God and to see the holy in the world around us. And so I, I think it's lovely what you do. Thank, thank you. All right. Where do I point this? <laughs> that way? It takes a second, though, is what I heard. There it is. Oops. Okay. So I'm Karen Blesson, and for many years I had the career of my dream when I was a 16-year-old kid in, in my small town in Nebraska. I wanted to be an artist, and I didn't have any clue what that was going to look like, but it worked out. And I worked with an agent in New York City and in Dallas, and I had clients all over the world, and it was exactly what I wanted. And then uh, something happened on an August night in 2000 that, that revolutionized my soul. It ignited me and it revolution, revolutionized my soul. I live in a nice neighborhood in Dallas, and it was about two in the morning, and my husband and I were lying in bed, and I heard a shot and a young man was shot and killed in my front yard. It was a completely senseless killing. Uh, the killers were found within two weeks because they used the credit cards of the, the victim within 29 minutes, actually, of, of, uh, of the shooting. So I wasn't so interested in why the murder happened because it was senseless. I wasn't interested in who did it because we found out right away. What interested me was what is the effect of one, one act of violence on the whole circle of the community around that act, on the people closest in, the families of both the victim and the shooter, the homicide detective, the people in my neighborhood, the people who loved all of these people who were involved. And I did a story that I worked on for three years called One Bullet for the Dallas Morning News, and in that, I interviewed all these people. Um, I couldn't go back to my, my wonderful life in my beautiful studio in my backyard because I had experienced this deep outrage. And really, I was, I was ignited by that. And I didn't know what to do, though. What do you do when, you, when something has happened? You can't go back to what you did before. What I, what I decided to do over a period of a, a couple of years was use what I know, which is art, to turn this holy outrage into action. So 12 years ago, with a friend of mine, Dr. Barbara Miller, who's the director of admissions for Baylor College of Dentistry, uh, we started a nonprofit organization with a mission to use art basically to make the world a better place. Uh, we, teach, we teach kids about nonviolence. That's one of the things we do. We, we're working really on two lanes. And one of these lanes is, is this educational program we do where we go into schools, we train teachers. We've now worked with over 49,000 kids in the Dallas area, kids from all different socioeconomic backgrounds. We are just as interested in working at the kids in the affluent private school as we are in working with the kids who are in juvenile detention or with, or with prostitutes who are trying to work their way off the street or with refugee kids, because we feel that these skills of not only creating personal peace, but how to navigate this world without resorting to immediate, like, violent acts is important for, for all of us. So, we have developed a curriculum, and that curriculum teaches things like empathy, compassion, a lesson called love, a lesson called respect, we're working on a couple, th three new ones now, one on forgiveness, one on wonder and curiosity, and one on that's called souls hidden, which is about everything that's invisible. Our it could be our ancestors, it could be our angels, it could be um, feelings. And we've trained over 400 teachers at this point. The kids are terrific. Um, one of the kids said, we learned about people who change the world in large and small ways. No matter how small we are changing the world, it makes a big difference. 
one of the things we do is that we, we work very hard to get our kids' art exhibited in public locations. I tease the kids that they've had their art in more great venues than I have. Our kids have had their art in the Dallas Museum of Art, in the African American Museum, at North Park Shopping Center, Neiman Marcus, at the Love Field, at, you go on and on and on, the South Side on Lamar, the Dallas Public Library, all around the, all around the city. One of the huge projects we did in 2013, how many of you are aware that Dallas fairly or unfairly garnered the, the label of City of Hate after the Kennedy assassination? Okay, well, uh, we in 29 Pieces were hearing these rumblings of a lot of journalists were coming into the city talking about City of Hate. How does it feel to live in a city of hate? Well, um, we didn't like that. We, don't, we see too much love around. We see some great, we see a lot of great teachers. We see a lot of kids who are filled with love. We started talking about what can we do. So we came up with this crazy idea to have 10,000 pieces of art created about divine love using quotes from great peacemakers, great poets, great artists, great musicians. And we intended to display them along the Kennedy motorcade route that President Kennedy, when he landed at Love Field, came through downtown Dallas and, and, and died in Parkland Hospital. So by some miracle, we, we did it. Uh, Charm was very involved in the project, and we had, uh, we had over 20,000 artists participating, created 10,000 pieces of art. We displayed the art in, I think, 67 locations. And the first exhibit was a beautiful exhibit at Love Field, and the last exhibit was at Parkland Hospital. So in that, we got a tremendous amount of press because, indeed, there were uh, people from TV networks, press from all over the world. We got something like 185 million press impressions from, from that project. So we got a lot of publicity from it. And publicity is something that we are not shy in our organization about pursuing. Um, when we plan any project, we plan how are we going to get the word out about this project because we feel like it's important. The one-on-one -on -one is super important with what we do with the kids or adults that we're working with, but just as important is for people out in the community to know about what we're doing. We, we've been working really since, since the tone of the election, way back in the primaries, was taking kind of an ugly turn, and uh, we were hearing from teachers that kids were replicating the kind of dialogues that we were hearing, and I'm talking way back in the beginning of the primaries, where kids were replicating the kind of uh, wordage that they were hearing on television. So we came up with a project called the Dallas Respect Project, and we wanted to reach out and, and touch as many kids and adults with this project that talks about how do, how do we really see each other as being in this boat together? How do we listen to one another? How do we respect people who don't look like us or who don't share our beliefs? So we, we created a project in which the, art, the art's round like viruses. We talked about how viruses can be a good thing and can, can spread in a healthy way if they're good things. And we created a pledge, a respect pledge, and we have asked people to, to go to our website and to sign it. Mayor Rawlings, the mayor of Dallas, happened to be at one of our events and saw a giant poster of the Respect Pledge and asked us to come to city council to challenge the city council members to uh, sign the Respect Pledge. That was interesting. Um, <laughs> um, one city councilman would not, would not sign it, the, the others would. Yeah, but it, it's, it's, uh, I understand because it's asking a lot. It's not something that we can pledge lightly to sit, have a room hold all of our beliefs and to sit and listen respectfully. It's asking a lot of, of us. And so to take a pledge, yeah, I, I, I like it when people take it seriously. So the other lane that we work on is 29 pieces of sculpture. After I told you about the, the murder that occurred, a um, couple of things came together at that time. I started to do a, uh, a meditation practice. Uh, at that time, I, I felt so angry. I felt so angry at the violence in this world and just the, 
the, the things that were happening, and I, I did not know how to challenge that, or how to channel it, rather. Um, about that time, somebody introduced me to a meditation practice where you memorize sacred passages from, from Christianity, from Judaism, from Buddhism, from uh, Hinduism, from Native American prayers, and you commit to saying them slowly and silently to yourself every morning for half an hour. And once I started that, it began inspiring the series of 29 sculptures, and that's where the, the title 29 Pieces comes in. These 29 pieces of sculpture are, are the other lane that 29 pieces, the organization, is in. We, we just finished this piece, which is a 20-foot mosaic permanent sculpture on Jefferson Boulevard in Oak Cliff. It's right near the, the historic Texas Theater where Oswald was captured. And it says, make my hands respect the things you have made. So it, when I was hearing the song that Tom was doing about the, looking at a snowflake or the Mahmoud Shabastari poem about really looking at all the beauty around us, that's what this is about. This is about looking at all the beauty we see, slowing down, slowing down, slowing down enough to, to really take it in. So this is the first, the first sculpture. We work with teams. We have t high school kids that are recruited from four different high schools in the area, from Sunset High School, Adamson High School. Th these names may mean nothing to you, but they're, they're diverse high schools in Dallas. And they go through a pretty, um, a pretty good application process where they have, to, they have to come to several meetings, do an application, do an essay, and then they have to show up at 8 o'clock on a Saturday morning for an, for an interview. The kids then are involved in a long-term project that goes on, any, this one went on 18 months before we completed the art. They work with great professional artists who show them everything from how to conceive of designs to how to talk about them. One of the biggest things we learned about is that kids really have a need to learn how to talk to adults. And so we're so proud that the kids we've worked with, these kids, can, can really, I, I tease them, that they can work a room as good as any adult that I know now. They, they would come in here and be able to talk to any of you about what we've been doing. They earn scholarships. Uh, the sculpture is expensive. It costs us about $250,000 to do that one sculpture. That money was raised through foundations, through individuals, through businesses in the Oak Cliff area in Dallas. But we, we gave over $22,000 in scholarships to the kids for every, I think, 30 hours they work, they got a $250 scholarship. And that's the, that's the program we're going to use for the next pieces that we do. We have a big dream. And our big dream, our big vision, and we're going to try to do it quick because I want to do it while I'm still living, is to do 28 more of these pieces and to turn Dallas into a city of sculpture. Philadelphia has a reputation as a city of murals. And we have this idea of Dallas as a city of sculpture. We're looking at the West End area in Dallas for the next three. We want to do three pieces in the next year. And these three pieces, and this, this started, this came up, these designs came up way before our current president began talking about walls. Um, we want to build three walls. And the first one is a wall of forgiveness. And this is just a, like a draft one, sketch one phase of it. This is not how it will end up looking, but it'll look something like this. This is inspired by a St. Teresa of Lisieux prayer called Living on Love. And I, we, we've been talking about walls a lot. And so think about walls. What are walls? Are walls only something that keeps you from me? No. They can, a wall can be something that keeps the the hailstorm away from me. A wall can be something that, that uh, um, gives us quiet and sanctuary. A wall can be something we can't even see. If I really don't feel like talking to you, I will build a wall right here. I'll build a wall right here and dare you to try to penetrate that. If I don't want you to talk to me, I'll talk nonstop so that you can't penetrate that wall of sound coming and try to and try to reach me so there's all kinds of walls and there's the wailing wall so we we don't we want these walls we want people who work on this and who who come to see these when they're installed 
to really think about what is a, what is a wall. Do we always want to break down walls or do we want to build walls? Do we want to build bridges? Do we want our walls to be transparent? There's all kinds of walls are, walls are not good or bad. We want ours to be good. This is going to be a wall of forgiveness. Um, the, the prayer line that inspires this one is, I see no imprint of my sins. In a moment, love has burned everything. So it's, it's in my mind, it's about the power of love to allow forgiveness and redemption. The next one is inspired by the Mahmud Shabastari poem that was read earlier, and it's inspired by a line called, cleave the heart of a raindrop, a hundred pure oceans will pour forth. We did a session at 9.30 this morning with some of the people who are here, which I asked the people to write their own response to that line. It was, I thought it was just beautiful what people came up with. So this one is about, um, about the beauty and the wonder of, of water. Where does that water come from? Cleave the heart of a raindrop. What does that mean? If we had a raindrop in front of us and cleaved it, where does that water come from? It's really very scientific almost. It's like, scientifically, where does it come from? Poetically, what does that mean to us? What does it mean when water evaporates from the Trinity River, from the Gulf of Mexico, and from the Ganges, and from the Indian Ocean, evaporates, all becomes one, and then rains on us. What does that mean? What kind of baptism is that? This one is inspired by a, a, a rabbi, Abraham Isaac Cook, and it's a prayer called Radiant is the World Soul. And it goes on to say, full of strength and wisdom, full of hidden souls. So this one, we want it to be about what's invisible. What, what, when we're looking at here, what's really around us that we're not seeing? And so, so with this one, we, we really, I don't know what direction it'll go, but I can see it going to be about our ancestors, about angels, about our feelings, about our loves. I wanted to just really kind of kind of face head on, just kind of face these last months and these last weeks. And, and um, as a person who's out in the world trying to teach nonviolence, trying to teach nonviolent communication, I have found the last months challenging. Um, I have found that I've had to really search for my guiding philosophy and to really search for where my commitments lie. And can I, can I hold within this one person heart and mind um, this desire to, to teach nonviolence and to teach peace and to teach empathy and compassion, but also to feel a lot of outrage and, and fear about this division that's happening between us. Because I am personally experiencing, I'm hearing a lot of people talk to me about how they are having trouble talking to their families, that Thanksgiving was very uneasy Christmas was very uneasy, and, and that they aren't going to see their fr old friends from high school or their older family. I find that hard to hold right now, and I'm, I'm just trying to figure out what is my, what's my philosophy? How do I move forward as a person who truly does believe that we all are one and that we're all connected, but I'm, I'm kind of mad, too. And, and so I, I keep going back to people who've come before us. I love this quote from, uh, these two quotes, from Septima Poinsettia Clark. She was called the mother of the civil rights movement by Martin Luther King. And she says, I have a great belief in the fact that whenever there is chaos, it creates wonderful thinking. I think I consider chaos a gift. Well, speaking for myself only, I feel like there's, there's chaos unleashed right now. And, and we can either look at it as something to be terrified by, which I do feel at moments, or as a great gift to try to really unthread it and figure out what is going on, what are the solutions, what can we do to pull ourselves together and to pull us back into the same, 
the same boat. We are on the same boat. How do we, what do we need to do to make this chaos a gift? Um, and of course, Gandhi. I could, I, this, is, this is kind of my quote that I tell our staff and our people and our kids all the time. Full effort is full victory. Satisfaction lies in the effort, not in the attainment. Full effort is full victory from Gandhi. And I don't think we have the capacity. I know we don't. We don't have the capacity to know the outcome of our actions. We have no idea if this one act of kindness is going to be repaid us or, or, if, or if, if that person's going to pay it forward. We don't know. All we do know is full effort is full victory. We can search our heart at the end of the day, and we can say, I did what I could. I did everything I could. I, can't, I could not have done any more. So these, I, this has been my saving grace right now, is to look back at, at Poinsettia Septima Clark, at Gandhi, at Mother Teresa, at, at uh, St. Teresa of Lisseau, at Mahmoud Shabastari, and know that there are greater, greater minds, greater spirits than mine who have faced chaotic times, and they were able to find some truths and beauty in, in that, and they were able to hold on to, to beauty. Um, so I think that I think that we have this this era, this era really of crazy opportunity for wonderful thinking and creative thinking ahead of us. For no matter what your political opinion is or where you stand, we have work to do. We have to step up our game, figure it out, figure out how to work together, how not to blow up this planet, how to protect this beautiful Earth of ours, and and work together. So with that, um, I'm going to continue what I do, which is using art to do that, using art to work with kids. And I hope that all of us figure out our ways to, um, to get real creative <laughs> in these next months and these next years, because uh, I think that we are all being called to, to, to come together somehow. So thank you so much for having me here today. Thank you. Yeah.